Hey everybody, Joe here from the Lions Led by Donkeys podcast. If you enjoy what we do here on the show and you think it's worth your hard-earned money, you can support the show via Patreon. Just a $1 donation gets you access to bonus episodes, our Discord, and regular episodes before everybody else. If you donate at an elevated level, you get even more bonus content. A digital copy of my book, The Hooligans of Kandahar, and a sticker from our Teespring store. Our show will always be ad-free and is totally supporter-driven. We use that money to pay our bills, buy research materials that make this show possible, and support charities like the Kurdish Red Crescent, the Flint Water Fund, and the Halo Trust. Consider joining the Legion of the Old Crow today. And now back to the show. I'm saving a dime. Out of every dollar for the family and me to share someday. Hello, and welcome to yet another lovely episode of this podcast that we do. Lions Led by Donkeys. It's the Lions Led by Donkeys. And with me. WTYP FM radio for some reason. (laughs) Oh God, the zoo crew is back. Um, (laughs) uh, I, I don't have enough sound effects for like, I don't know, Joe. Leo. Oh, that's um, good. Why do I have a long order noise? I don't know. There's only there's only two up here. The other ones I have is like the, the USSR's national anthem and Russian hard base. Oh, okay. Um, Can't get rid of those. Um, I, I needed like a fart noise uh, to to really uh, harness the '90s DJ energy that we're going for. Um, Liam, uh, uh, how you doing today, buddy? Oh, I'm fucking terrific, bud. Outstanding. Because uh, we're talking about the Rwandan genocide today. Good. Uh, you know, I'm, good. I'm, I'm already I'm, in the mood for it. I'm kidding. <laughs> I am ready to. I'm. I'm ready to learn about the radio stations being seized. Uh, that I, though I can promise that's probably coming summer summer of 2022. Uh, because I have. I am now in a grad course about the Rwandan genocide. So. <sighs> Yeah, look forward to that. Uh, but I'm actually going to talk about something we had, uh, honestly don't talk about that often. Um, even though we go back to the World War II content mine quite quite regularly because you know it's only the, the one of the largest armed conflicts of human history. Um, but the Pacific Theater specifically about World War II, we've talked about it a little bit. Um, like we've talked about the uh, Japanese soldiers being left behind, like the stranded ones um, or yeah, the holdouts. Like the first rather. episode I was on. Uh, the you first did, one you that you were on, I, I think, was um, uh, the first one you were on. I think was the torpedoes. Uh, okay. Actually, also incorrect. It was the Jewish Avengers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we talked about the Unit Seven Thirty One before. That was, a, I believe, a Halloween episode a couple of years ago. Um, we like, but we haven't talked much about the actual combat of the Pacific Theater. Uh, well, I don't know how that happened. Um, whoops, my bad. Um, so today we're going to talk about probably one of the more formative, horrific, and forgotten battles of the Pacific Theater involving the United States military, and that is the Battle of Tarawa. Um, now, uh, if you've ever watched the Pacific, which I still hold is better than Band of Brothers, this is depicted in there. Uh, but oftentimes, uh, we don't like to talk about this one. We like to talk about, you know, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, Guadalcanal, because they're like triumphant victories, right? Midway, Midway, Coral Sea, um, stuff like that. Uh, Tarawa was also a victory. However, <laughs> well, you sound convinced. <laughs> yeah, um, you know it's 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 not it's hardly a triumphant victory, um, but we'll get there. So I do have to yada yada my way through some some of the the general Pacific theater stuff. How we got there, uh, for instance, when I talk about Pacific theater of World War II, most people probably remember it for. One or two things, namely the nuclear bombs, uh, maybe Iwo Jima, Okinawa, the flag raising, etc. Um, but the thing that we generally, at least not anymore, you don't see it depicted is just how awful the war was. Um, the slow grinding war of attrition that the no, allies... Hopping, it's not your friend. No. Um, and specifically, we're kind of talking about the birth of island hopping today. Uh, what, what would become island hopping, I guess we could say. Um, now, this is because this war was awful. It was a slow, grinding war of attrition, mostly between the United States and Japan, though other allies were involved. Um, the Commonwealth was involved in some islands, uh, the British more specifically, and like Burma. Um, 
modern day Myanmar, but uh, specifically in the in the island hopping campaign that we envision in the American narrative, we get some help from like Australia and stuff. Um, <laughs> that's cool, I guess. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Um, now, the reason why we generally don't like to think about these, specifically the Battle of Tarawa, is because we were effectively reducing one another into a soup-like homogenate over islands so small that many of them could be measured in literally the singles of miles. Um, so you know, these tiny, insignificant tracts of land would end up becoming the graveyards of thousands of people. And it's hardly something you can turn into fun movies and such. Um, though attempts have been made. <laughs> Bless them. Yeah. Now, some that stick out are, you know, like I said, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, Guadalcanal, um, which at some point we will definitely talk about all of those, though they will probably be significantly more than one episode. Definitely Guadalcanal. Um, but uh, like everything in the Pacific War, the background of this and Japan's imperial ambitions throughout the Pacific are tied to the U.S. cutting off their main supply of oil, that being us. Uh, for committing unspeakable war crimes throughout China. Now, we'll obviously go into this a bit more whenever we talk about, say, Pearl Harbor. Uh, but this is the too long, didn't read version. Of course, this started with attacks on Pearl Harbor on December 7th and quickly spread throughout the Pacific as the Japanese Army and Navy elements struck at various European colonial and American holdings, as well as a few independent nations for good measure. Hong Kong, Guam, Wake Island, New Guinea, the Solomon Islands, the Philippines, Singapore, and a few others were all invaded or fell with only a couple of months after the start of the Pacific Theater. By January 1942, there is a legitimate worry that the Japanese might invade Australia, as weird as that is to believe. Yeah. Well, they've invaded, uh, what is the city I'm thinking of? Shanghai. Was there about Singapore? They invaded Singapore. Yeah, they invaded Singapore, Hong Kong. Um, yeah, that's not all that far. Specifically, the Battle of Singapore is very embarrassing, uh, which will definitely yeah. get a series or episode of its own one day. But I mean, they invaded Papua New Guinea. Uh, like, they're right off the coast of Australia. I was putting one ahead of the other, yeah. And uh, not to mention, they bombed Australia about like a hundred times, uh, which I'm sure <laughs> Australians listening are like, yeah, no shit they did. But Americans absolutely do not learn about this in school. No, we're very dumb. Uh, it's very much American centric and more specifically European centric uh, when it comes to World War II. Um, and like uh, reading about how realistic these dreams were invading Australia, I believe were a, a, a victory would have been a pipe dream. Because I just don't think Japan had the military capacity to do this. Um, but an actual attempt was not. Like the Imperial Navy heavily favored the invasion of Australia, but the army thought it was a very bad idea. And owing to the constant internal bickering between the two branches of the military, which included various political power plays, the occasional coup, and more than one assassination, um, the army had more political pull at the time. So the Navy's plans were kind of shelved i can could you just imagine a, like japanese military division just getting lost in the outback <laughs> uh yeah it's 900 miles to the nearest airstrip because everything is four days from everything in australia uh this is a kangaroo he's your best pal and your only hope of survival look his name it, is jim good luck to you <laughs> if the emus could beat australia japan's fucked like at this point japan's already invaded a large chunk of china uh, which is az absorbing, you know, untold amounts of uh, of manpower on top of invading all of these small islands, uh, defending the holdings that they have. The invasion of Australia is not a realistic thing, though. I would argue so is an, an, a realistic invasion of China, but they attempted that too. Oh, uh, yep. Uh, you know that Japan was, was was definitely attempting to Kirby the Pacific and didn't work. Um, now as you can imagine, to all these things, um happening so quickly the allies were on a bit of a back foot in the pacific and it wouldn't be until mid to late 1942 before they're really able to get their shit together in order to start striking back there were obviously like stability operations attempting to put defenses in place but things were not going great um now th these led to victories like at the battle of midway and coral sea which were kind of irreversible for Japan, you can't lose that many aircraft carriers and shrug it off. Right. 
It, it, now, like, I think we talked about this before, like, way back in the day during our Kamikaze episode. It's more the accumulation of casualties and defeat more than any singular defeat when you can no longer replace all of the fucking veterans and experienced people you're losing. Like, pilots are hard to train. Right. Specifically, like, naval pilots are hard to train. Were, were we talking... Did did you guys do an episode where like they shortened the training for pilots down to like 15 days by the end of the war or something? We talked a little bit about it when we talked about kamikazes. Um, there we go. And uh, we talked to, we'll talk a little bit about this more in like a future series I have planned uh, more to do with Germany and Russia. But um, yeah, they, they attempted to shorten. And to be fair, the Japanese pilot program was like obscenely difficult when the right. when, when the right. Pacific War started. So they just kept chipping away at it and chipping away at it until it's like, fuck it. You're not going to land anyway. So here you go, kid. Um, but yeah, I mean, those that accumulation of loss of experience is is what hap- is what really breaks the back and uh, of Japan in the situation. Uh, but when it came time to start reclaiming islands, leading to the Battle of Guadalcanal, uh, part of the larger uh, Solomon Islands campaign, things kind of got bigger and bigger. And at, at this point, there's no there's no longer any way for Japan's going to win. Um, that, that ship has sailed. Uh, their only hope of winning, even if you consider it a hope of winning, was uh, the United States deciding they didn't want any of that smoke after the Pearl Harbor attacks, which is honestly one of the dumbest fucking military decisions I've ever read. Oh, no, but we we wanted that smoke, baby. Yeah, I mean, like it, the the attack on Pearl Harbor was so egregious that even the like the the isolationist campaign in the U.S. is like, yeah, we got nothing on this one. Fuck them. And the the, the, the right, roll it. <laughs> yeah, like the isolationist movement uh, in the United States was like largely fueled by like uh, Lindbergh and a lot of anti-Semitic people. Uh, also, and, also to JFK's dad. Yeah, JFK uh, himself donated to it. Yeah, and it, like, it, but to be fair, like once Catholics, man, once Pearl Harbor got attacked, they're like. Yeah, never mind. We're go ahead. Well, USA, USA. Because it's like, really, it's really away easy. Your, your American German bud banners. <laughs> <laughs> like it's really easy to be an isolationist when shit isn't getting blown up. Uh, I would say in your it's backyard, but Hawaii is a fucking fair distance away from that. <laughs> but still, like you know, the attack killed out what almost three thousand uh, uh, American yeah. sailors, airmen, whatever. Uh, so yeah, Japan really fucked themselves on that one. And even Admiral uh, Yamamoto was like, "This is absolutely not going to work." Uh, but we'll definitely talk about that more when we talk about Pearl Harbor. Um, but so far, Japan had a tendency to not meet invading forces on the beach in defense. Uh, they chose instead to allow allies to land and funnel them deeper in, into whatever island they were landing on to prepare deeper and more complicated kill zones. I, it's hard to argue which of these work better honestly because during world war ii most of the time no matter what island defense or beach defense you had amphibious landing succeeded um so it it really seems to be the 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 once an amphibious landing begin obviously like the landing at calais comes to mind as a miserable failure but like most of the time when you launch an amphibious assault, you have such a buildup of, of men and material that's like, all right, well, that's two waves down, shove six more in there. Like you're eventually going to win through sheer force of bodies. Right. So it's hard to argue which one of these is better. But they decided that they were going to def- have a defense in depth. Um, and this is actually where one of uh, a bit of a, a historical misnomer comes from where Japanese were like legendary jungle fighters. They weren't. They actually had no training in that. Um, and Japan doesn't have jungles. And, and most of these kids are from like urban areas or rural farmland. <laughs> like they're not like they're not like jungle ninjas. What what it <laughs> came ninjas. what it came down to is fighting on the defense is always easier. Uh, and there were like specially trained uh, like special force units in the Japanese military. We talked a little bit uh, on our on our. Um, uh, uh, what, what do you call it? Remaining Japanese soldier episode. There's a bonus episode yeah. at the five dollar level. Go get it. Um, where, but there were like hundreds of people, maybe thousands. Uh, there's not enough. There's not like an army division of specially trained jungle soldiers. It just didn't fucking uh, exist. No jungle ninjas. It just turned out that when you get a whole bunch of Midwest farm kids who turn into Marines to invade fucking Guadalcanal, they're like, "Oh shit, Haas, what is this?" It's very easy <laughs> to shoot them in the face. Um, ah. <laughs> yeah, fair yeah. enough. But in Guadalcanal, the Marines met the uh, the 
Japanese met the Marines further inland, and there were army units in Guadalcanal as well. I'm not ignoring them, but Marines get talked about the most. Um, kind of like Fallujah, in that, but you know, in this case, we actually won. Um, oh damn! Uh, but there was there is some ideas that the Japanese did intend to resist the landings, um, but they were just like a fuck up of intelligence. Uh, and there were some outlying islands uh, that did resist landings, but it was an uncontrolled, uncoordinated way. However, it was an organized defense of the beach. That would change with the Gilbert Islands campaign of 1943. And holy shit, would it change? Now, I do have to talk about the Gilbert Islands a little bit because there's a good chance that you probably have no idea where they are, what they look like, and how small they South, are. They're the South Pacific. Sure. That's and, all I know. Okay, I'm done. Have a good podcast, Joe. <laughs> they're virtually in the middle of nowhere. Um, yeah. They're a small chain of uh, atolls and coral islands, several thousand miles between Papua New Guinea and Hawaii. Uh, so and it's truly I, the middle of fucking nothing. <laughs> yes. Now, nowadays, they make up the uh, part of them make up the nation of Kiribati, which I promise you, if you look at how this island nation is spelled, you will not believe it's pronounced that way. I was going for Kiribati, so. (laughs) Admittedly, I only know it's pronounced this way because of the Geography Now YouTube channel. Shout out to that guy uh, for helping me with this one. (laughs) Really led me into a wormhole. Um, Now, the Gilberts were were and are tiny, tiny specks of islands. Um... Now, the reason why they're important is because of war. They're literally not important for any other strategic reason. Uh, the, the, these various islands that the Japanese controlled acted as something of defensive perimeters for other islands they controlled. By invading and taking over the Gilberts, the Allies could then open up the Marshall Islands, which in turn would open up the Marianas Islands. It, it, this is where island hopping comes from. Man, this sucks. <laughs> yeah. Like the, the, these are islands that are so small. They literally are only important because like if we were to sail and because we can slap, slap an airstrip on it. Eh, kind of small for that. There was an airstrip, Damn. but it's real small. Um, sure. Now, the reason why the Marianas were important was the airstrip, not the Gilberts, now, because the Marianas were so close to Japan. They were within bomber range with an airstrip. So, of course, we wanted that. Now, the reason why the Gilberts were important was to invade other islands. The Gilberts themselves were useless. Uh, Now, to set up forward bases capable of supporting operations in the mid-Pacific to, say, the Philippines and to Japan, the U.S. wanted to take the Mariana Islands. The Marianas were heavily defended, and naval doctrine of the time, and honestly, probably today as well, uh, would hold that in order for these amphibious assaults to succeed land-based aircraft would need to be required to weaken the defenses and protect the invasion force now the nearest island to support those was again not the gilberts but the marshals Fuck. <laughs> taking the marshals would provide the base needed to launch offensives into the marianas but the marshals were cut off from direct communication with Hawaii by a Japanese garrison and very small air base at the western side of the Tarawa Atoll in the Gilbert Islands. That meant for all of this to succeed, they would have to take the tiniest fucking island the U.S. would fight a battle on, probably ever. And <laughs> really the most annoying order to receive. It's just like, fuck it, just turn it into glass. Now, I need to point out just how small the Tarawa Atoll is. It is only 11 square miles total. God damn. But the majority of the battle would not take part on the Tarawa Atoll. The, the battle gets the name Tarawa because that is the simply part of the bigger part of what the island is actually part of. So that is the, the, the Atoll bears the battle's name. But it would take place on an even tinier island called Batio. Now, Batio is only two miles long, mind you, and at its widest is 700 meters. It is entirely flat uh, with terrain mostly of rocks and coral, and like a lot of it is completely unusable. Uh, Now, I say about two miles long because it's more like a high one mile. It has been uh, compared to the same size as Central Park. Okay. Now, if this sounds like a custom-built kill zone, you're pretty much right. Uh, And to make things worse, the Japanese had an idea that the Americans were going to attack Beitio. 
in August of 1942, Colonel Evan Carlson and the now legendary Macon Island Raiders raided the other side of the Gilberts on Macon Atoll. Uh, so other than this being mostly a victory for the Americans, it did let the Japanese know like, oh, fuck, they know we're here. They're going to they're going to come back. They're going to invade it's us. Coming, Something's going to sure. happen. Yeah. So that meant they needed to dig into Beitio. So on February 1943, the Japanese set the 6th Yokosuka Special Naval Landing Force, as well as the 7th Sazbo Special Landing Force, to reinforce Batio Island. Uh, Now, these islands are sometimes called Japanese Marines, despite that not actually being a thing that existed um, to make things easier, because they had like special landing forces and they also had landing forces. The Japanese Imperial Navy and Army was really into different titles for very small units. Um, Now, If these guys are better or worse than the normal Japanese Imperial Army conscript um, it is really up for debate because you read some things say the special landing forces are much better, the better led. Um, They're more in uh, they have more morale, so they don't retreat. Uh, But then you read other reports like they actually kind of suck at attacking things because there's (laughs) they're purpose made amphibious landing units literally in their name. Right. Right. Um, And most of the time they were used invading undefended islands or islands with very small garrisons, say like Wake Island, which was like defended with almost as many civilians as it was Marines. Um, And other times they'd invade parts of China and just get dusted Uh, like they didn't they did not have a great um, reputation, though for defenders, like I already pointed out, defending makes you look like a goddamn hero most of the time. So. In the when you see, when you see U.S. sources writing about them, they'd call the special landing forces, which their name would then be changed, like special defending force, gotcha. um, would be like, oh, these guys are the the best the Navy has the to special, offer. Yeah, they, they weren't, uh, and also they weren't like purpose built seals, but it's literal seals. <laughs> oh, that's just cute. Arf, 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 like a fifty cal. Uh, that, that my favorite technical. Um, like also they weren't like Marines, like you know, the Marines in the Navy, while one branch, like the Marines are separate, right? In the U S in the, in the Japanese Imperial Navy, these guys, the special landing force sometimes called Japanese Marines were just sailors picked for landing duty. Like Not they true. were, they were given very cursory infantry training, but like, there you go, sport. Um, All right, but, you're a real soldier now. Get out there. champ. <laughs> but they, they did have a different, uh, command structure than the Japanese Imperial Army, which was known to be incredibly top heavy um, and not so good at small unit leadership, which despite all of the problems that the U.S. military has is one thing that they actually are good at is small unit leadership. Um, and the special landing forces were were better at that, allegedly. <laughs> we're not ready for you to praise the U.S. military's uh, small unit leadership. I'm I'm honestly only helping myself there because one of those was me. Oh, oh um, that's right. No, Took was, a savior, buy his book, Hooligans of Canada. <laughs> well, especially back in the day, the U.S.'s um, like reliance on non-commissioned officers was pretty unique. Oh, gotcha. Um, okay. Most that. militaries are super top heavy with officers commanding everything. Um, right. And the, the U.S. is more of like, ah, do what you want, <laughs> which worked really well uh, until it didn't. Um, sure. Uh, another thing that was put into place is Japanese Rear Admiral Keiji Shibizaki, I think. Uh, now he nailed is, it. yeah, nailed it. Fucking tag that one up there. He was a veteran of several amphibious landings during his tour of duty in China, and and I say successful because he didn't die. Um, because there's these All success we need. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, when it comes to amphibious landing, sometimes to be like a grizzled veteran just means you you didn't die like everybody else. It sucked real good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great beach running kid. Uh, now they put him in charge uh, because, you know, hypothetically, if you're trained to do amphibious landings, you know really well how to reject one, right? Uh, there would be no defense in depth on Beto Island or BTO Island uh, like the Japanese had been doing. Now, there's a very good reason for that. There was simply no room to do that. Uh-huh. Um, you only had like so many feet of beach to fight over before you're just on the other side of BTO Island. <laughs> They would have to defend every inch of the beach and every inch of the island, all fucking one and a half miles of it behind it, in attempt to bleed the Marines white. There was no intention of winning this battle. They knew it was going to be impossible, but their goal was to simply kill as many as you can, 
Maybe they'll fuck off, but at least we'll buy some time, right? Sure. Now, unfortunately for the invading Marines, he was also an engineer by trade. Uh, so he put his trade and skills to use, placing 14 def- uh, coastal defense guns dug in and concrete firing positions, building 500 pillboxes out of logs and sand because he didn't really have any materials to work yeah, with. All right. right. He scattered 40 different pieces of artillery around the island and reinforced firing pits. And all of this is linked together by trenches and defensive strong points. And all of them were linked by running point. So like a trench couldn't be cut off from another trench, meaning runners could always get back and forth for supplies, medical stuff. Uh, They also could uh, lay communication wire. Not that that would matter much, but we'll get there. Um, Now, there's also like um, uh, 14 type 95 light tanks that he had uh, at his disposal, which are terrible tanks. Legitimately the worst of World War II. Um, uh, we we dog on the Imperial Japanese military often on this show, and it's because they deserve it. And specifically, their tanks were comically bad. They're very bad. <laughs> uh, there's one I actually got to see one in person, very very up close here. Uh, That's cool. And oh my god, they're so small. Uh, yeah. I, I can I'm taller than it. Tracks wow. up almost. You're um, what five five? No, oh, yeah, a solid four three. Yeah. Oh, tiny <laughs> little Joe. <laughs> Um, they were very underpowered, virtually no armor. Um, like an infantry squad could very easily kill this tank without a anti-tank specific weapon is how weak it is. Oh, damn. Yeah. Um, like a heavy machine gun can puncture the armor. Um, Wow. Okay. Yeah. It's real, real bad. That's bad. Yeah. Uh, now the Japanese knew, uh, that their tanks sucked. Like they didn't see tanks as very important. They saw them as specifically an infantry support platform which is true. However, you do need to make it survivable when it comes up against, I don't know, a guy with a 50 caliber machine gun or another tank. They neglected that part, but they knew their tank sucked. So they used them as dug in and placed weapons, which is unique. They, I believe they actually did the same thing later on in Iwo Jima. Um, but there was more than just the Japanese defenses built into this island. Um, the, the defenses went all the way to the beach, and then they built seawalls, uh, which were not there before, to make landing very, very hard. On top of those seawalls, they built heavy anti-boat machine guns slapped right there on the beach. Like, there was, there was no place for Marines to land. It butted right up against the seawalls, which were mined and barbed wired and full of machine guns. Now, the reason why Big the move. Japanese... Yeah, no, this would normally be a very stupid idea because you just have an exposed position out there. But the reason for this was the island was kind of uninvadable. Well, if it's that small, one would think. Right. Um, uh, There was a 500 meter thousand, uh, sorry, 500 meter wide, 1000 meter long shallow reef that surround the islands North, which is where the invasion was going to come from, which was so well known for fucking up boats during the wrong tide that the Japanese had to build a really long pier just to get around it. Um, also, there were several Japanese boats stuck in the reef that had <laughs> well, <hey guys. laughs> that, they just, that they just abandoned, uh, which they also then turned into machine gun platforms. Sure. Um, this is no secret. Uh, but now, Shibazaki looked over all of these defenses and told his men, quote, it'll take 1 million men 100 years to conquer Tarawa. Now, that was not true. But facing him, Shibazaki would have the largest American fleet ever assembled up until that point. Oh, damn. Which, which okay. included 17 aircraft carriers, 12 battleships, 66 destroyers, plus 36 different types of transport carrying the entire 2nd Marine Division, as well as parts of the U.S. Army's 27th Infantry Division. Now, the United States had 30, 000, over 30,000 men arrayed to invade the Gilberts, which gave them a 10 to 1 advantage over the Japanese invaders, and also more of a population than exists today on those islands. <laughs> I think the, uh, the island, uh, like Tarawa itself, has like a pi- population of 17,000 today. How do you? That's still like a lot of people. It's very, very densely it's very packed. Dense. Yeah. <laughs> But that doesn't mean the U.S. was exactly enthusiastic about the concepts of this invasion. Now, uh, a lot of this comes from the writings of Norman Moise uh, or Moises. Moises might be pronouncing your name wrong. Sorry, bro. Uh, He was a Marine part of the invasion force, which uh, had the code name Helen. Uh, Now, he 
was got, he got to sit through like the uh, the rousing speeches that officers give out and stuff. He was specifically an Amtrak crewman, um, not, cool. not, not not that kind of Amtrak. Oh, <laughs> I was gonna say <laughs> it wasn't formed until seventy one. So <laughs> laying down track all the way to the beach from like Philly. Well, let's go. You guys have tickets. <laughs> you guys have tickets. <laughs> I'm gonna get on the Portland to fucking Beto Island Amtrak. <laughs> Cafe cars open, bitches. Let's do this. <laughs> Uh, so an Amtrak was uh, an amphibious tracked vehicle. Um, it, That's much lamer. It's honestly even lamer than that. Um, they're known for being horrible, unreliable pieces of shit back then. Even worse today, honestly. Uh, there's obviously newer versions exist. They exist now mostly to break down and drown Marines occasionally. Um, oh. <laughs> But it looked like a, a normal armored personnel car- uh, carrier, though, if it fucked a boat. Uh, okay. And it could very, very slowly make its way through rough ocean water. Um, and they were good for, like, climbing over obstacles on the beaches and stuff like that. Gotcha. Now, he, that's what his job was. Is Norman was, a, was an Amtrak crewman. Now, he said, quote, several days before the landing, our small group was called together and informed that there would be approximately 80% casualties among our Amtrak people. Our group went quiet, too quiet. To break the spell, I put an armor on our corpsman, which is what Marines call medics, and said, quote, I'm going to be sorry to see you go, fella. And then everybody burst out laughing, including the corpsman. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, expectations were not high. Um, now, like most amphibious landings, the Americans opened fire uh, early in the morning with uh, a heavy air raid uh, over the island, as well as a sustained naval bombardment. Now, according to Norman, uh, as well as the movie with Marine, with the Marines at Tarawa, there's around four million pounds of explosives dropped on this tiny island. Fuck. Though it doesn't have too much of an effect. Um, now, the reason for this is because that the Japanese didn't have many building materials on the island. They just dug down really fucking deep. Which. Sure. It, Turns out is really all you need to do. No, they're it, the the bombardment did do something that would fuck up the defenses. Though I can't see any stretch of the imagination where this succeeds if this doesn't happen. And that is, despite doing all of this reinforcement, uh, all this digging, the Japanese actually neglected to bury their network cables uh, very deep for their radios. So when the island gets shelled and bombed, it severs their communication lines. Yeah, we did one thing, right? Yeah, it's kind of like an important thing to like sleep on, in my opinion, but whatever. Now, this forced the Japanese to use runners. Uh, as you know, we've talked about before, it's just a dude with a letter. Um, right. A letter, if you're lucky. Sometimes uh, I know the Japanese were uh, very, very worried about uh, having runners intercepted because they would rely on runners a lot, especially in China. Mm. Um, it's one of the reasons that, that their military is just incredibly weirdly advanced and also strangely backward at the same time during the same war um, that a lot of the times small units didn't have radios. So they would have to use runners, but they were so paranoid about runners being intercepted, having letters taken runners would have to memorize what their officers told them, meaning you're playing combat telephone. Right. And hoping that they uh, remember it. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, hypothetically speaking, all of these units are connected via their trench system anyway, so you can easily run runners back and forth. So this led to a slowdown of information rather than a total failure, at least for now. Now, the bombardment was called off 10 minutes before the Marines packed into what are known as Higgins boats, which are the vast majority of them are packed in, as well as M-Tracks. We're supposed to make landfall. Now, a Higgins boat is what everybody has in their head when I say amphibious landing. It's the oh, boat from D-Day. Panel up front. Yeah. Yep. It's the boat from D-Day. Um, now, Higgins boats were not good for the Pacific. They were okay for Europe. Um, the reason for this, we'll get to that point, is they need a fair amount of water in order to work. Yeah. Now, the Amtraks would be uh, the first wave, though. And the reason why the bombardment was called off 10 minutes before was because it was putting out a lot of smoke and so much smoke that the pilots of the Amtraks and the Higgins boats couldn't fucking see where they were going. So they had to call, they had to call off. Yeah. (laughs) Whoopsie doodle. Uh, You know, that's the one of the problems with smoke screens is 
Nobody can fucking see that. <laughs> if they don't know what we're doing, if we don't know what we're doing, how can they possibly know what we're doing? Exactly. Get let's like some like 4D chess amphibious landing brain thinking there. Um so they call it out and wait for the wind to pull away the smoke. Now, if you're wondering, well, couldn't that just mean the Japanese can see them coming? Yes. Yes, yep. it did. Yeah, hell yeah. It's to show it's 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 just strike fear into their hearts is what. Yeah, make eye contact as we slowly get mangled on your beach defenses. Hey, guys, we're here to invade. So remember those reefs that we talked about? Yeah, those are going to become very important. Oh, no. (laughs) Now, the U.S. knew about them, and they simply assumed based on their tidal charts that they had that the water would be deep enough for the Higgins boats to make it ashore. Well, it turns out sometimes, regardless if you have tidal charts or not, Tides are kind of unpredictable, and they were way lower than they were supposed to be. Now, this also was not an unforeseen problem. Because they had been warned ahead of time by a New Zealand liaison officer who was familiar with the tide pattern on uh, the Beto Island area and said, it's always lower than you think it is. Right. And they said... Fuck you. Yeah, fuck Why you, we- Kiwi. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot they were Kiwi. Sorry, our New Zealand listeners. So they ignored him, uh, and the invasion went ahead. Uh, and those reefs would... Well, I don't know if blood is good for reef, um, but if it is, oh, these fuckers are probably immortal now. Um, now... As the Amtraks, which were the first wave, began to approach the beach, the Japanese actually held their fire until they were about 50 meters from the beach, waiting so long that the Marine with the... So there's a very, very good video called With the Marines at Tarawa that it, I'm not going to encourage anybody to go watch because it's very graphic. Sure. Um, so it, it's where we get, honestly, some of the, the most jarring... Um, footage of the American side of World War II because this guy was was a Marine and he's taking incredibly graphic footage of Marines. It right. was so graphic that it was refused to be released until FDR himself signed off on it. Wow. So uh, the cameraman who was filming uh, Marines at Tarawa during the invasion assumed like other battles, the Japanese had simply retreated further inland uh, and they would la- land unopposed at the beach. Like that's what the narrator is saying in the video. Right. Uh, Marines are like smiling on the the Amtraks and shit. Oh, no. Yeah. Or another thing is, remember, they just bombard them with four million pounds of explosives. Like maybe the bombardment killed them all. Fuck it. We don't know. Well, some rules uh, didn't happen. Um, Then the the, the Japanese infantry or Marines, whatever, uh, opened fire when they're only about 50 ish meters away tearing into the first wave of Amtraks. Amtraks are not heavily armored because remember, they have to be able to float. Right. Uh, Now, the Amtraks kept moving forward, attempting to dislodge their troops, but they were stopped by the seawalls, which they did not have the ability to climb over. And then behind them became uh, came the wave uh, waves of Higgins boats. Now the Higgins boats need about four feet of water in order to draft, but they need five feet in order to turn. The tide on this particular day was three feet, so that meant as soon as they got into the uh, the area of operations, the Higgins boats hit the reefs and got stuck. Now the Japanese kind of had an idea something like this would happen. And they had sent divers out there to plant mines all over the reefs, as well as barbed wire in the shallow water, which also had more mines on it. So the Higgins boats stuck in the reefs triggered the landmines that the Japanese had placed. This forced other Marines seeing this happen, seeing this happening, like, oh, dear, fuck, we need to get out of here, jumped into the water, which was about chest high for most of them, attempting to dislodge their Higgins boats from the reefs, like shaking them loose all while they're being shot at. I remember thousands of machine guns and artillery yeah. um, all while. Remember, I don't know if you've ever been in a reef before, a coral yeah. reef. Incredibly have, sharp. Yes, it hurts. So these people, these guys are getting torn to shit by barbed wire that's in the reefs, the reefs themselves and gunfire all while weighed down by 60 pounds of gear. Uh, now, they realize they cannot knock the Higgins boats loose. Uh, so they decided they'd have to wade to shore, which was at this point about 700 meters away. Oh, fuck that. 
Now that and remember, chest high, you can't run. You're being torn to shreds by by the reeves, the barbed wire, the uh, the landmines, machine gun, rifle fire, cannons are tearing through everybody. Now at this point, the Amtraks that got to the seawall began getting blown up, set on fire, and disabled because they're now a sitting duck. The ones that made it through to get stuck on the first wall of seawalls couldn't make it over, creating something of a traffic jam of dead, yeah. destroyed vehicles on top of a growing number of bodies. Uh, not to mention all of the Marines that were dying just behind them in the reef. Now, noticing how bad off the Higgins boats were, the Amtrak guys kind of turned into the heroes of the story and decided, fuck, we cannot leave these guys to wade through that water. They kicked out all of their infantry to take cover behind the seawall, which was literally their only cover, which was still in the water. And then they turned around and drove back out into the reefs to try to pick up these guys that were wading to shore. Now, th- at this point, the Higgins boats are completely fucked and the Amtraks are the, o- the biggest targets out there, leading them becoming a gigantic magnet for fire. Right. Now, the, the same uh, guy I was talking about before, Norman, was in one of those Amtraks and said, quote, I told Bro, which is a nickname for one of his crewmen, to stop along two Marines whose rifles were held at port arms wading through water towards the beach. I told them to get on board and we'd take them to shore. Both look frightened. The one that appeared to be leading said, quote, no, I again told them to get in the uh, get aboard the Amtrak. And this time he yelled, get that fucking thing away from me because it was drawing so much fire. They figured they were safer in the reefs than in the Amtrak. Fuck that, dude. Oh, fuck, fuck all of that. Nope. Yep. And soon so many Amtraks and Higgins boats were stuck in the reef or destroyed. They created an obstacle for more reinforcing waves to come in. Soon, Amtrak drivers had no choice but to run over the dead and dying who are caught in the barbed wire in the reefs, creating a corpse pier. What a phrase. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome. Unfortunately, that tends to come up quite often in the history of warfare where they're like, corpses are a road now. Uh, It happened again. Jesus fucking Christ. Marines trapped in this nightmare uh, dis, uh, found out a really bad thing about salt water and electronics, and yeah. that is their radios wouldn't work. Right. Because the vast majority of Marines had to jump into the water. Even the ones that had come to shore and survived the Amtrak journey were pretty much sitting in a pool of water behind the seawalls. Uh, so they couldn't contact the fleet to tell them what was happening or contact air support. This was made worse than one of the supporting ships that was supposed to come close to shore to act as a relay yeah. for these, fired their 16-inch guns, and then somehow had them traversed in such a way it knocked out their own comms array. Jesus fucking Christ. Oh, it's a comedy of error. Oh, tragedy of errors. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, yeah. the phrase that comes to mind. Soon more and more waves hit the beach, getting pinned down behind the long seawall or lost out on the on the reefs, creating a bigger and bigger literal dam of corpses. With so many people, they were running out of places to hide. Soon men were having to take cover behind other men, and three or four ranks of people were piled behind single rocks. Other people had no choice but to hide behind the dead. Ugh. The first attempts to get tanks to shore ended with their Higgins boats, you guessed it, stuck in the reefs. Yep. Finally, landed Marines got organized under the command of Colonel David Shoop. Uh, funny last name, but also a future commandant of the Marine Corps. Uh, now, Shoup was involved in the planning of this battle, but had not been originally meant to lead any part of it during the invasion. That was left to a guy named Colonel William Marshall. But then Colonel Marshall had a nervous breakdown overlooking the plans right before the invasion. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Which, yeah, sure. <laughs> then General Julian Smith promoted Shoup, and this would actually be Shoup's First ever time in combat or commanding anything ever. Good for him. Let's all like the present. Good luck to you. To be fair, he he hit the beach like a boss. Uh, he immediately ordered like or organized what he had into a cohesive whole to include like units were so uh shattered and lost that like one got nicknamed the orphans because it was a unit like oh. slapped together by some lieutenant made up of Marines from other units. Um <laughs> 
And now as soon as he stormed ashore, he got wounded twice, catching shrapnel on the leg and getting shot in the fucking neck. Nope, I like that. <laughs> but he just kept on going because, you know, sometimes death is more of a suggestion. Um, uh. Now, he finally organized a breakout from the seawall to, to get an assault further into the island, more just to make room for more Marines because there were so many people on this tiny sliver of cover. There was nowhere to go. Right. Now, finally, some armor support finally made it to shore when the first Sherman tanks triumphantly appeared to support the Marines and then flipped and fell into a shell crater oh, in the Jesus beach. <laughs> in other places, smaller Stuart tanks released too early and sank. Then another got hit by a rocket, taking its cannon out and reducing it to a mobile pillbox. <sighs> Now, at the end of the first day of fighting, only one tank that made it to shore would still be operational. <laughs> oh, what's better than none, I guess. Unless you're one of the tankers, honestly. That yeah. sounds miserable. Like, we're going to the beach. Why is everything wet? Fuck. <laughs> I just wanted to go home. <laughs> <laughs> From this precarious position, General Julius Smith Radio General Holland Smith, no relation, mid-afternoon, stating successful landings on beaches Red 2 and 3. Toe hold on Red 1. The situation is in doubt. By the end of the first day, the Marines hit a tenuous hold on all three landing zones, designated 1, 2, and 3. Now, they are corralled onto these very, very narrow beaches, and no unit had penetrated more than 70 yards inshore. Oh, shit. Now, by nightfall, being driven back into the sea was a legitimate threat if the Japanese managed to throw together an organized counterattack, which was coming. Not to mention, Marines described the weather of Tarawav like being in a sauna, a tropical island uh, like with, that was pushing nearly 100 degrees with nearly as much humidity. There was not nearly enough water to go around, and men were passing out right and left from heat stroke and exhaustion after only a few hours of fighting. Ugh. Like one of the things that uh, Amtrak crewmen remember, it was... Uh, uh, when people were running to their vehicles when they'd come to shore, what they assumed were like evacuating wounded, they were desperately asking for water. Oh God! Uh, now there were trying to they were trying to ferry some people out from the combat zone onto the Amtrak back to the fleet if, that they were wounded, but it was slim fucking chances, man. There is a very rare chance an Amtrak is making more than a one way trip. Right. Uh, that is the one time. I will say that probably luck more than anything depended on completely turned the case of the entire battle. Hey, winning ugly is still winning, baby. That's true. That's true. <laughs> and I say that because the Marines on the beach, remember, no more than 70 yards onto the island were graced with quite possibly the biggest stroke of luck in all of military history. By the end of the first day of fighting, the Japanese commander was getting pretty pissed about how slow his flow of information was getting because, you know, his comms wires were fucked up and it was based on some dudes sprinting through a combat zone and playing telephone while trying not to die. Not right. the best way to send and receive messages. And to be fair, I can't imagine a situation where he could order a quick and decisive counterattack if he hoped that the system was going to work. He would have to get closer to shorten his line of command. So he ordered his entire command staff to pick up stakes and move closer to the fighting. This would shorten the distance for runners and it could give him the needed edge on this decisive moment of the battle. That is, it could have. Ooh. If at the same time, he and his entire command staff were out of the bunker and moving toward the new spot, a U.S. destroyer, nobody is sure which one, lobbed a shell directly into them, killing them all immediately. Oh, uh, that, that <laughs> will do it. That works. There is absolutely no way the gunners on the ship could have known what they were shooting at, meaning they fired what has to be the luckiest shot in human history, completely obliterating the entire Japanese command structure on the island in seconds through sheer dumb luck. Now, Pretty much everybody agrees that Shibazaki's next move was to launch a bonsai charge down the beach that probably would have destroyed the invasion of Tarawa or come very close. Uh, obviously, there were still tens of thousands of men in reserve. Another wave would have just come. I'm not saying that they would have won. Right. Um, 
maybe we would have been like, all right, maybe this island isn't worth it, but probably not. Um, going off of what normally happens in situations like this and would occur more later on in the war, a bonsai charge is certainly coming. And most people, when they think of a bonsai charge in their head, they're thinking samurai sword wheeling, screaming, uh, uh, ninjas, yeah, a melee assault or whatever. And th- it's more accurate to think of as more directly a, a frontal counterattack than anything to do with swords. Granted, the officers would have swords, but more often than not, they used firearms uh, because they weren't stupid. Yeah, fair enough. Instead, with Shibazaki dead and literally every other regimental commander dead too, the there was just no command structure anymore. And there was no counterattack. Japanese soldiers just sat in their bunkers doing what they were last told, which was holding and defending, waiting for right. orders that would never come. From this point on, each Japanese unit and each Japanese position would act completely independent in its own isolation from a greater command structure. At this point, the battle is over. Now, by the end of the first day, of the 5,000 Marines put ashore, 1,500 were casualties, either dead or wounded. Jesus. Mostly dead. From that point forward, the Marines moved steadily further inland because the organized defense is kind of dead at this point. Now, with fresh supplies and reinforcements, they were able to call in naval and airstrikes on the hundreds of pillboxes and trenches they came up against, slowly chipping away at the advantages that the Japanese had on the beaches. The Marines also landed several mortar units and their own artillery as well. So the amount of fire now being point out, put out accurately on the Japanese is not something that they can overcome. Right. Now, there was still hundreds, if not still a thousand more Japanese dug in at various points of the island. So the advance was still incredibly deadly. There was almost nowhere for Marines to hide. Remember, like I said, it's effectively just a flat barren island there's palm trees and stuff but they'd all been cut down to make in the pillboxes or blown away by the literal millions of pounds of explosives that had been dropped on the island there was virtually nothing for marines to actually use for cover other than other captured japanese defenses which would they would also be surprised whenever they jumped down inside to find japanese people hiding in there when they like <laughs> like uh way behind their own lines yeah it's gotta be a mind fuck they were effectively forced to walk uncovered through a barren moonscape uh, oh. and like hope that they didn't get shot. And whenever you look at footage from Marines at Tarawa, you'll see like five people crowded behind like a tree log collapsed in sure. the open because it's the only thing to hide behind. Uh, most of the Marines are just like kneeling out in the open. Right. Now, another problem uh, the Marines ran into were Japanese soldiers who had been buried alive within their bunkers from the bombardment. And I don't mean buried alive as in they're like, they have to go rescue these men um, because that doesn't happen. That sounds fucking nightmarish. And it was, but the, the soldiers buried inside were buried so deep that there was air pockets and they were still able to fight. Oh, no, that nope, 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 nope. Don't like that. <laughs> so there would be like mounds uh, or collapsed uh, bunkers and stuff that still had a fighting hole sticking out of them and Japanese people shooting out of it. And the Marines had no fucking way to assault the subjective because there's no way in. And they're right. like 20 feet underground. So you can't just like put a satchel charge on top of it. They'll still survive. They just survived getting hit by a fucking naval cannon or whatever. So they had to land bulldozers on the beach and literally dig them up while fighting. Like you can see you can in the video, you can see bulldozers pulling things apart and Mm -hmm. like a Marine with like a pistol peering in. Like every time they'd shovel up a chunk of dirt, they'd have to cover it with a gun because they didn't know when they were actually going to hit the air pocket where the Japanese soldiers were hiding. That is fucking terrifying. Like in other cases, they would call in bulldozers to like collapse them more and hopefully just suffocate them because they're not going to fire fight over every like piece of, of dirt on the right. island. But BTO was so small that when the actual frontline defenses were broken, there wasn't really much left for the Japanese to do. There was no room for defense in depth. There was no right. room to maneuver, regroup and launch a counterattack. So they, they just rapidly broke down. 
So instead on day three, November 23rd, at around 4 a.m., they the Japanese decided to launch their last hurrah at the Marines with a 300-man bonsai charge. Now, this one mostly was a hand-to-hand affair because they had run out of ammo at this point. Sure. Nearly all of them were killed, though like most bonsai charges, there's parts of it that are weirdly successful and like yeah. snap through a, a, a weak part of the, of the link that makes up defenses. And there was like some bayonet-wielding soldiers that made it all the way through the front line and then like ended up next to the cooks and like near the <laughs> rear and like they oh, like hey guys. <laughs> they like put down their soup and gun these guys down right quick like nice. oh, hold hold my goddamn fucking ladle or whatever you know um, what the worst part of this is he he bled into a perfectly food safe bucket it's still good it's still good everybody just has cholera now hope you guys like human being soup <laughs> it, don't worry, it's just borscht. Don't don't ask where I got all the red from. Uh, when the last Japanese stronghold was a bomb-proof blockhouse garrisoned by around a hundred men, and if that sounds crazy, all these guys packed into a very small a small area. It was taken out by about twenty-one people. Uh, now, a guy named Lieutenant Alexander Bonnieman Jr. Had led a very very small detachment of around twenty-one Marines, where they flushed them out of this bomb proof blockhouse by throwing in a satchel charge through it's like um a, like breathing hole sure uh which caused them all to run out where lieutenant bonnieman and a machine gun were waiting for them that'll do it yeah bonnieman was uh was wounded in the exchange and, and ended up getting the medal of honor but uh like it's I, I really don't like referring back to something that has nothing to do with this, but it's like that scene from Band of Brothers. It's like, it's a whole other company. Yeah. <laughs> and they're just coming over the hill because they assumed it was like 30 people in there or something. Right. And there's 100 people ran out. And so Lieutenant Bonnieman ordered his men to like retreat and he covered his their retreat and died. Um, but ah. they also took out the last organized position. Um, RIP well, to a real one. Yeah. So... He's actually buried here uh, in an area called the Punch Bowl, which is not its real name, um, like the Veteran Cemetery, wherever they find um, like unclaimed remains or like because a lot of the time um, when uh, like all these Marines died, they would be buried on the island. Right. Uh, it's actually a pretty relatively new thing for bodies to be brought home for burial. Right. Um and uh, he was buried in one of the graves there and then eventually disinterred and brought here. I think okay. he was then disinterred again and brought home. I, I don't remember. Um, so by the time the t- this tiny island was declared secured on the 23rd of November of the Japanese garrison of 3,636, only one officer and 16 enlisted men surrendered. Everyone else was dead. Jesus fucking Christ. Among the dead on the island were Korean slaves uh, that the Japanese had brought with them. They had brought 1,200 and only 129 survived. Um, there's some evidence that they were killed in the bombardment, like sent out on purpose uh, during mm-hmm. unsafe times. And there's other evidence that the Japanese simply murdered them when they realized that they were losing. Um, now, the second Marine Division suffered 894 killed in action, while additional 84 of, uh, of the wounded would later succumb to their wounds. Another 2,188 men were wounded in battle. Now, remember, this is in three days on an island roughly the same size as Central Park. All right. For a comparison today, the island of Beito, Etio, has a population of around 17,000. The amount of dead in 76 hours was 6,400 total. Now, the public backlash for this, this incredibly high amount of casualties over such a tiny meaningless island in a short period of time was immediate and the government couldn't exactly censor the amount of people being told their sons just died right now uh uh, i think it was nimitz uh admiral nimitz said that he had received like literally endless letters from angry angry family members for the rest of his life um yeah i can understand that (laughs) yeah uh general holland smith compared it to pickett's charge and said, quote, was Tarawa worth it? My answer is an unqualified no. From the very beginning, the decision of the Joint Chiefs to seize, seize Tarawa was a mistake. And from their initial mistake grew the terrible drum of errors, errors of omission rather than commission, resulting in these, in these needless casualties. Now, to this day, 
Islanders occasionally will still find skeletal remains on their very, very small island. And as recently as 2019, another marine mass grave was found. Wow. It's estimated that there's, at minimum, still 100 unaccounted for bodies somewhere on the island, and nobody's entirely sure where. Jesus. Now, um, I know some people will be mad if I don't point out that Tarawa was a a, a lesson learned for the United States military. Uh. Now, this included the need for underwater demolition teams to clear mines and barbed wire and seawalls and things. This led to the founding of the Navy Underwater Demolition Teams, or UDTs, which eventually spawned into Navy SEALs. So, yeah, right. we have Tarawa to thank for that. Um, though I, I also think that the – I say this as someone who did not go to school for military history nor ever attended a military academy where this kind of thinking is taught – I don't think there is a bright side when it comes like, well, we learned so much. No, that's just well, meat grinder shit. Yeah, that that's like uh, what's like when you tell that's what you tell someone when they fail a test. Well, you'll do better next time. Well, I fucking hope so. Yeah. Um, I think it's a cop out personally. Um, it and it, it, it always it, it's covering your own ass for your failures. Like obviously this is a victory. They won the battle. However, did they? <laughs> like go on. Right. A um, Pyrrhic victory comes to mind. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's a hundred percent the same brain that ends with um, like Napoleon in Russia saying we've taken the we've we've taken the field as he sits upon like twenty thousand dead bodies. Right. Like yeah, well they just left it. Like when, what did we really gain? <laughs> um. So that is the Battle of Tarawa, and unfortunately, the Pacific Theater in a nutshell. Uh, obviously, we'll talk about the subject more. Right um, down the line, because I'm, I'm very interested in it. It's like you don't see that kind of treatment being done to the Western Front of Europe. Um, right. it's, it's certainly a different kind of fighting between right. two different enemies, but you know, um, it's one of those situations where whenever you read about the Eastern Front, to a lesser extent, because there's a racial supremacy uh, idea in mind uh, on one side or in the Pacific theater's case, both sides, um, which is a very weird point to, to have. So there wasn't a, uh, like, it was one of those situations where a quarter was not asked for or expected. Right. Uh, and, you know, that's why we have, uh, there was a lot of ideological issues as to why the Japanese soldiers refused to surrender much of the time. And there was a lot of the idea that the Americans simply would not surrender because they knew what would happen to them if they surrendered. And by and large, that was not an unfounded fear. Right. <laughs> Uh, there were like large amounts of of Americans to surrender, a large amount of British to surrender at various times. But it was large groups rather than isolated incidents. Like, you would see people writing accounts from the Western Front. They feel very comfortable surrendering to the Germans. Right. Uh, and the Germans didn't feel so bad about surrendering to the Americans either. Well, they did but, not want to surrender to the Soviets. No, they sure did not. Just like I, if the Soviets did not want to surrender to them. <laughs> right. Like we both understand what's going to happen here, right? Like this, this time in captivity will be very short and bloody. Uh, but that is the Battle of Tarawa. Um, so we do have a quick question from the Legion today, um, which is more about the behind it, behind the scenes stuff of podcasting. It says, uh, "You guys both host podcasts. Why do you uh, have? Why do you not have ads? Why do? Why are you not part of a network or something?" Um, I, we uh, refuse to. I mean, that's my quick answer. It's that the the ads we get, I will go a little bit behind the scenes. We get ad requests all the time. I assume you get more ad requests than I do because you're on YouTube. Yeah, we get two or three a week. Um, people will usually send us emails uh, basically saying, what's your price? But uh, we we make enough from Patreon that we don't really, we also really don't feel super comfortable advertising at all. You know, if if I don't use a product personally, I'm not going to vouch for it. Um, if, you know, I've said multiple times, I'm not really joking that if buysnews.com came to me with an, uh, with an ad offer, I would listen. But yeah, we don't, in order to A, preserve our integrity and B, we just don't need the money that bad. Yeah, I mean, I solicited ads way back in the day. And I, and of course, people remember that I did run an ad once. And it was because I knew the guy personally. Uh, so, like, I wasn't lying about anything I said. Also, I, I remember feel, that. <laughs> also, I feel like um, 
Uh, part of me would would like like if iHeartRadio came calling. Part of me would oh, certainly yeah. entertain that offer simply because I'd rather take rich people's money than listener money. Yeah, that's, you could. That's that's yeah, that's fair. And you could still in, have this show in its current form, and I wouldn't have to take anybody's money to be able to pay my bills, right? I right. would take advertiser money. However, I I understand now that's simply never going to happen. Um, I think we have we have, and you know, well, there's your problem has a has a unique. Uh, show as well where we're not exactly advertiser friendly no we're not i mean um, we're we're hard not yeah um and as far as like uh, the closest thing to a network i think we have is just i i simply share a pro- extended universe yeah i simply share a producer with a ton of other people and we all work together all the time um and it's like uh, of course part of it goes into the, having a patreon allows us to be completely independent at no point yep. can anybody tell us other than our her own really just Nate tells me that something I probably shouldn't have in the show or I should reword something. I'm never going to lose. Well, unless you guys really don't like it. Um, Like it's never going to cost me money by voicing my opinion on top of history, uh, which a lot of people find distasteful, um, which I think is why academia is, is incredibly boring and hard to parse because they make it that way on purpose. Yeah. So I got out of academia. Yeah, and I, I am getting further into it, and I hate it more. Uh, but like, I that's why that's why we do this show is to allow to kind of distill that into something entertaining. Um, because I think people find history boring because of what it looks like, not what it right. actually is. Uh, and I think by doing that, there's shows that do this already that are part of. I mean, to some extent, that are part of networks. And nobody's calling. I mean, I've had a few requests. Like, I. I and I uh, hilariously, I think I made a joke like this is what happens when your podcast host is Armenian because I had like Manscape reach out. <laughs> That's funny. We have not had Manscape. We've had War Thunder. Of course and, you have. Everybody gets War Thunder and Raid Shadow Legends. We haven't gotten Raid Shadow Legends. We've got uh, a VPN. A couple of VPNs have reached out. Oh, yeah. It's like the U- I'm surprised you didn't get uh, the, the headphones or voice trying to sell on YouTube now. Oh, Raycons? Raycon. Yeah. Uh, I'm- yeah. Yeah. Th- they're scam. I'm a, Don't I'm just, buy them. Yeah, I'm just gonna start cutting fake ads in the middle of incredibly inappropriate areas. We like, thought about doing that. Yeah. When, when uh when an Amtrak is churning over a dead 18 year old conscripted marine, I'm like, you know what doesn't churn over dead 18 year old conscripted marines? VPN. Um, <laughs> Manscape. Yeah. You know. You know what? He doesn't have to worry about anymore. Manscaping. Brought to you by Manscape. Um, I mean, like I did reach out. It's a bit of a bit now. I did reach out forever ago to um, uh, Old Crow, which I did not know was like a subsidiary of a larger distiller. They're owned by Jim Beam or Buffalo Trace. I think it's Jim Beam. Um, Beam. And I sent like their customer service rep, like the the only email I could find. This is a long time ago when we were a very, very small show. I think we might be able to swing it now. Um, But their simple answer was just no. Like <laughs> I didn't even I didn't even get the HR like thank you for contacting us and being interested in our project product blah 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 it was just like no signed like Sarah from HR <laughs> well for the shot <laughs> yeah uh, but yeah that's the fun of of podcasting uh, advertisers suck don't I, I don't want to have them uh, yeah same so thank you for supporting the show you make all of us not having to do that possible thanks guys um and Nate or uh, Nate. And Liam. Uh, That's me, baby. Uh, oh, yeah, just, oh, because he's Jewish and I'm Jewish. Is that why? <laughs> Fuck you. Uh, and, and Nate for having to parse everything we just said into something that's palatable. Uh, thank Love you. you. you thank dog. you for, uh, for joining me. And uh, for everybody, um, don't invade small Pacific islands. They tend to kill you. Yeah. Be, watch out for those reefs, baby. <laughs> watch out for the reefs. Feed the reefs outside of Australia blood. Maybe they'll come back to life. Later.